Jesus Christ. Amen. This past week, as I got deeper into my research for this weekend's message, um, my mind turned to America's obsession with success. I don't know, perhaps it's just human nature, but who doesn't want to be successful? Who doesn't want to change the world? So I got on the interweb, and I googled it. <laughs> and uh, did you know there's a whole magazine dedicated to success? Guess what it's called? <laughs> success Magazine. I was like, what? It, this, this magazine actually started in 1898, and with the purpose of personal achievement. And it was actually relaunched in 2008. And uh, as I was uh, surfing the web, um, I found that in Success Magazine, there was an article of the top 25 books written on success. Now, I'm not going to share all of the books with you, but I'm going to share some of the titles with you, starting from five, counting down to one. Some of the titles you may be familiar with. Others were completely new to me. Let me know. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You heard of it? Okay. Stephen Covey. Um, nine Steps to Financial Freedom. Yeah, that was a darn for me too. Donut hole. All right. Um, think and Grow Rich. Really? Okay, cool. Last night, you know, it's just weird to see what you people are reading. Um, the, the richest, here, here's another one. The, number two, The Richest Man in Babylon. Well, okay, it's number two. You've got to read it. Um, and then number one, you've heard of it, How to Win Friends and Influence People, yep. right? Someone actually said the title, or, or the author. Yeah, all right, okay, um, whatever. Uh, so, yeah, obviously there's a lot of books, and, and, and these books are concerned with financial success. Um, all of these pr books promote ways to accomplish a lifestyle of success. And then I was like, wait, hold on. Guess what book wasn't even mentioned? Not even hit... I, you guys want to just preach this for me? I'll sit down. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was really surprised. I'm like, you know, three world, major world religions believe that this is the word of God, inspired by God. Uh, Christians call this the manual of life in which, in which uh, you know, success is defined for us. And yet the article didn't even give it like a, hey, and don't forget the Bible. I mean, whatever. Okay, so... Today is the third message of our series, Blessed, the Surprising Secret to Hashtag True Happiness. And today's message um, has everything to do with success. Success in the most surprising way. Success in the most ironic way. Success in the most divine way. So let's look at today's scripture together. And um, I'm actually going to read them twice because... They're so short, you might miss them. From Psalm 37, verse 11. The meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. The meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. Matthew 5.5, 5, today's featured scripture. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then lastly, Matthew chapter 8, verse 36. For what does it profit a person to gain the world, but to forfeit their soul? What does it profit a person to gain the world, but forfeit their soul? So I'm starting today's message by looking at this phrase, inherit the earth. Some of the blessings from what are known as the Beatitudes are otherworldly. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What's that about? Jesus is sharing wisdom that applies to the here and now. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit in the earth applies to success in the here and now. By the standard of standards of this world, success seems to be obtained by, honestly, what are ugly means. People scratch and claw their way to the top. Businesses eradicate the competition. Politi politicians line their pockets by making backroom deals. 
Throughout history, thugs and bullies, both high and low, have used muscle and used violence to get what they want. Turning these worldly standards upside down, Jesus instead taught, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In other words, Jesus taught the meek shall succeed. The meek will change the world. So it's absolutely critical that we leave here today understanding what this word meek means. In English dictionaries, they define meekness as deficient in courage. And let me say categorically, no matter what it means in the English language today, it does not mean that, that in today's scriptures. Meekness is not cowardice. Meekness is not spinelessness. Meekness is not a willingness to have peace at any cost. It's not lacking in confidence. Meekness is not shyness. Meekness is not simply being good-mannered. Meekness is not conforming to social convention. And meekness is certainly not a lack of conviction. So what does meekness mean? Simply, simply put, uh, if you're using uh, the U version online or using our outlines in your bulletin this morning, number one, meekness means perfect power perfectly controlled, and perfectly applied. Perfect power, perfectly controlled, perfectly applied. In Matthew 5.5, 5, the English word meek is translated from the Greek word praus. And I know it sounds German, but it's actually Greek. It's translated from the, word, the Greek word praus, and praus is only used four times in the New Testament. Now, what this means then is that we not only need to study the word as it's used in the New Testament, but we also have to look at the broader uh, popular Greek vernacular within the time in which the Gospel of Matthew was used to understand this word. Now, in the broader classical Greek, of, in the time that Matthew was written, this word praus was used in three, with three different types of people. Doctors, sailors, and farmers. Now, for the doctor, meekness, number two on your outline, is like the perfect dosage of the right medicine. Meekness is like the perfect dosage of the right medicine. A doctor used this word meek to describe a soothing medicine that would take away the pain. In this context, meek would be the perfect medicine used the perfect way. The perfect medicine for a diagnosed condition used in the perfect way to accomplish maximum healing. Now, we all know uh, with medications, uh, let's say you have a back pain, severe chronic back pain or something, and you get a prescription, uh, you go to the pharmacy, and let's say the doctor, it's the right prescription, it's the right drug that can help you, but the, the doctor, for whatever reason, uh, does the dosage in too small of an amount. And so you take the pill, you take the medication, but you don't feel any pain relief, right? Why? Because the dosage isn't correct. Now, the other extreme is also true. Too much of any drug can lead to overdose. It can lead to, you know, unfortunately, you know, death. Those are the two extremes. And neither of those would be described as meek. In the broader class classical Greek, the word praus was used by doctors. It was also used by sailors. Meekness, number three, is like a perfect wind to sailors. Meekness is like a perfect wind to sailors. Sailors use the word meek to describe a lovely, cool, refreshing breeze. That same lovely, cool, refreshing breeze experienced by sailors would have been important to them because it's the very same wind that would literally empower their livelihoods. Not enough wind, nothing happens. Too much wind, and we all know that too much wind can generate dangerous hurricanes over the oceans, damaging tornadoes over lands. Neither of these two extremes would describe the word meek. Remember, meek is perfect power, perfectly controlled, perfectly applied. 
so then, in the broader classical Greek, the word praus was used by doctors, it was used by sailors, and lastly, it was used by farmers. And in this case, then, meekness, number four, is like a horse broken in. Meekness is like a horse broken in. And I'm sure at this point you're thinking, my gosh, we're going to be going home in five minutes. <laughs> meekness, number four, is like a horse broken in. <laughs> the image most closely associated with this word meek and its meaning is that of a horse. The Greek historian Xenophon, that's what, that was his name, the Greek historian Xenophon used the very same word that Jesus use, uses in, uh, five, uh, in Matthew 5.5, 5, blessed are the meek, to describe a horse broken to saddle. The power of a horse, the strength of a horse, the might of a horse harnessed under control. The horse is a powerful animal, and in the Greek world, the horse was a symbol of strength. To man, a horse, wild and untamed, is useless. It can't be used for any of the tasks a person would have for it. However, if a horse is broken, it can be used for all kinds of productive tasks for which it is uniquely qualified to carry out. To describe a horse as being broken in, as meek, is to then describe a wild, powerful animal brought under perfect control in the service of its master. A tamed horse is a picture of power under control. By extension, then, uh, William Barclay uh, writes in his commentary, Therefore, the person who is meek is the one who has every instinct and every passion under perfect control. It would not be right to say that such a person is entirely self-controlled, for such a level of self-control is beyond human power. But it would be right to say that such a person is God-controlled. Thus, a person surrendered to God, a person surrendered to God's purposes for their life, could be described as meek. Now, if you've followed my line of logic up to this point, then my next point shouldn't be too much of a surprise to you, too much of a leap, too much of a stretch. Number five, meekness is like me yoked to Christ. Meekness is like me yoked to Christ. Me yoked to Christ. Jesus uses such an image of anyone who follows him as a valued workhorse. Jesus did so when he invited others to take his yoke. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, come to me, Jesus said, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek. That's one of the four other times that this word is used, praus. For I am meek, humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am meek. Now, a yoke was a wooden frame that was put on the backs of animals and strapped around the necks, taking two animals and joining them together for a common task, for a common purpose. For, for plowing a field, um, for, you know, carting a load. This picture would have been familiar to Jesus' audience. In biblical times, a young ox was yoked to an older, more experienced ox so that the older ox might train the younger how to perform properly. For example, by bearing the same yoke, an untrained younger ox would soon learn the proper pacing of pulling a plow and would learn to heed the direction of the master being yoked to an older ox. So in order to manifest meekness, 
we yoke ourselves to Jesus because he is the essence. Jesus is the epitome of meekness. Perfect power. Perfectly controlled. Perfectly applied. Now, all that I've shared up to this point helps describe meekness. But what I thought I'd do is share some examples with you as well so that we can better wrap our minds around this idea. As we've come to better understand the descriptions of meekness, such as a wild horse broken for saddled and bridled, or as yoked, um, I think we can better understand why in the book of Numbers, Moses is described as being meek. Now, many of you know the story of Moses, but how many of you would give him the description of meek? A, a strong leader, um, brave, uh, but meek? But then I began to think of that story of Moses. <clears throat> and if you remember, uh, he was adopted into the uh, Pharaoh's home um, and, and Ray is basically in luxury. Um, he, he kills a, 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 an Egyptian and then he, he flees. And, and then God meets him in his hiding. And he calls him to go back to Egypt and to free the Hebrew slaves. And if you remember the story, Jesus, I mean Jesus, uh, Moses doesn't go, you know, willingly. He, he actually goes kind of dragging his feet and, and arguing with God. And, and one of the things he raises is that, I, you know, he's not equipped to do this. Um, who is he to go back to the Pharaoh and, and speak like this to the people? And, and he says, I'm not a good speaker. I mean, I, I really don't have pu good public speaking skills. And so God's like, well, okay, I will provide for you, you know, and so on and so forth. Now, fast forward the story. And you know, to the end where, you know, the, the Hebrew slaves have been delivered from slavery. They've been wandering in the desert for 40 years and they're about to enter into the promised land. And the Moses we see then um, is a much different man. He's uh, more seasoned. He's wiser. You don't see so much pushback from Moses. You don't see him dragging his feet in order to um, give himself over to the will of God. That is meekness. No one would question that Moses was a successful leader. Of course, this is a biblical example of meek, but I want to share and uh, make some suggestions uh, of examples from our own American modern history. I want to start with Susan B. Anthony. Amongst many things in her life, Susan B. Anthony was a, an abolitionist and a suffragette for women's rights. Susan B. Anthony was born in 1820 and brought up in a Quaker family with long activist traditions. Early in her life, she developed a sense of justice and a sense of moral zeal. As early as 1856, um, about 35 years old, Susan B. Anthony was an agent uh, for the American anti-slavery movement. And she would arrange meetings and she would make speeches. She put up posters and she distributed uh, leaflets. During this time, she encountered hostile mobs. She encountered things being thrown at her and she uh, encountered armed threats against her. In Syracuse, she was hung in effigy and her image was dragged through the streets. Ignoring all of this opposition and abuse, over her lifetime, Anthony traveled, lectured, and canvassed across our nation for the women's right to vote. She also campaigned, as I said, for the abolition of slavery, uh, the right for women to own property, the right for women to retain their own earnings, and the right for women to serve as jurors, which I'm sure half of you today really stand against even now. <laughs> In 1900, Anthony persuaded the University of uh, Rochester to admit women into that school. 
uh, this was a, a, as I was looking, uh, reading about her, I thought this was just a, a humorous aside. Susan B. Anthony advocated for dress reform for women. She believed so strongly in this during her lifetime that she, there was a year in her life where she cut her hair short, and instead of wearing the dresses of the time, she would, she would basically make all these public speeches, uh, uh, public speeches in, in the bloomers. And yeah, you laugh. So did everybody else. And she found that the public ridicule uh, was so strong that it actually took away from the, the, <laughs> from the point that she was trying to make. Uh, she died in 1906. And 14 years later, in 1920, American women finally won the right to vote with the 19th Amendment, also known as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. She wasn't mighty. She didn't raise a sword. She didn't act out in violence to accomplish her goals. But nor was she weak. She was not a doormat. Perfect power, perfectly controlled, perfectly applied. And she changed the world. Or here's another example. <clears throat> On December 1st, 1955, a 42-year-old African-American woman, woman who worked as a seamstress boarded a Montgomery City bus to go home from work. And on this bus that day, she sat near the middle of the bus, just behind the 10 seats reserved for whites only. Soon all the seats in the bus were filled. And when a white man entered the bus, the driver insisted that all four blacks sitting just behind the white section give up their seats so that the man could sit there. This African-American woman quietly refused to give up her seat. Her action was spontaneous, and it was not premeditated. Although her previous civil rights involvement and strong sense of justice were obvious influences, she later said, when I made that decision, I knew that I had the strength of my ancestors behind me. She was arrested and she was convicted of violating the laws of segregation, also known as jo uh, Jim Crow laws. Of course, this woman's name is Rosa Parks. And she appealed her conviction. And by appealing her conviction, uh, she single-handedly changed the legality of segregation. And the rest, they say, is history. She wasn't mighty. She didn't raise a sword. But neither was she weak. Neither did she allow people to walk over her like a doormat. Perfect power, perfectly controlled, perfectly applied. She was a success, and she changed the world. Of course, I could talk about Martin Luther King Jr., but I won't. I don't need to, because you know that story. Here's the point I want to make. For every Susan B. Anthony, there were thousands of faceless women who fought right alongside her for all the same causes who are now lost to history. And for every Rosa Parks and for every Martin Luther King Jr., there are hundreds of thousands of peoples whose names we will never know. But nevertheless, we are indebted to for making our nation great. In other words, these faceless masses took a stand for what was right. They stood their ground and they succeeded. And they changed the world. Perfect power, perfectly controlled, perfectly applied. The meek shall succeed. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So let me close with this. You're thinking, Jonathan, that's great. But I'm no Rosa Parks. I'm no Martin Luther King. Really, how do these, apply, these points apply to me in my life today? Listen closely, because it'll go by fast. <laughs> Strength and integrity in whatever your daily business is may be. Strength and integrity in whatever your daily business may be. Strength and integrity in every relationship in your life. 
strength and integrity in every relationship that you're in. Don't overindulge in power. Don't allow yourself to be a doormat. Don't overindulge in power. Don't allow yourself to be a doormat. Where those two ideas meet, that's where meekness abides. Don't leverage your position over other people. Don't assume that you don't have a position to leverage. Where those two ideas meet, that's where meekness abides. Perfect power, perfectly controlled, perfectly applied. It can change the world. In that place, you'll discover the blessing of the meek. Let's pray.